The college football playoff makes changes. Greatest Iowa athletes of all time. Maybe we even delve into getting you set for spring football practice. A whole bevy of things we could delve into concerning Hawkeyes football right here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate you stopping by each and every Tuesday, 5.30 Eastern, 4.30 where it counts. That's where Corey Brada is, of course, from the Hawkeye of the Storm. That should be your destination on a regular basis. Make it every day at uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Corey, how are you doing today? Doing good, Mark. It's nice and warm. It's like 60 degrees here in central Iowa today. It is here, too. Oh. You know, it's when you have these days in December or even January, you enjoy them, but you're like, okay, this is, we're done. I mean, it's not like this is going to continue. I don't think this is going to continue here. It's not spring yet, but it, when you see February 22nd, or tw- I guess no, it's, today's the 20th. When you see February 20th on the calendar, you're like, okay, maybe we're, <laughs> this is a sign that we're closer to the end of the, the uh, dark tunnel than we thought, but I uh, enjoyed the sunshine today and uh, it feels like spring. Because I grew up in Ohio, spent my younger portion of my life in Ohio, and then moved to New England, spent 21 years in Connecticut. I I would tend to make those comparisons in terms of weather. Uh, I would always look at, you know, oh, my family's back in Ohio. It's whatever the temperature is there. Here, it's a little bit colder. Even when I moved to Connecticut uh, to take a job there. I made that comparison because I told people I'm moving to Connecticut and they were like, man, isn't it really cold there? And I said, oh, I think so. And then I would make the comparisons and it's generally five to eight degrees warmer in the winter months in Ohio than it is in Connecticut. Okay. And now since we sometimes make those weather comparisons, it sounds like it's a little warmer here in Ohio than it is in Iowa. Oh, I'm guessing it is. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like sometimes you make these uh, proclamations about how cold it is. And I think hey, it's cold, but it's not that cold. Yeah. Well, this winter has been unseasonably warm, with the exception being the one week where we had those two huge winter storms and that Arctic blast. Um, I think they said, I remember hearing back in the fall that it was going to be a, an El Nino winter, which would indicate potentially um warmer weather. And I think we've seen that. So we'll see. Now they're talking about maybe uh, a La Nina um, fall in 2024 into 2025, which would indicate colder, wetter. So anyways, we'll see. And it's hard to, I don't think it's the same as like looking at Punxsutawney Phil and his shadow, but I, I don't know that it's an exact science. So, uh, but it's, it's nice to, to feel like there's a sense of spring in the air and football you know, with the college football playoff announcement down, you know, it makes us it's really good timing for the show because we just talked about Iowa's, you know, prospects moving forward for potentially making a 12 team playoff. And I think, you know, without knowing what the future is going to look like, how many years Kirk sticks around with this being the last year where I was going to have an opportunity. Well, they are retaining a bunch of guys that had an extra COVID season available. Like, I, I know. It, it can, it's easy just to say, well, they got a play a chance at the playoff this year. I think they have a chance at the playoff this year because of all these guys coming back that a lot of people didn't expect to have made that decision. Like I didn't expect Jay Higgins and I certainly didn't expect Nick Jackson to be back. Um, You know, I, I don't think I expected Luke Lachey to be back, especially when he was playing as well as he was last September, you know, but he gets hurt and you know, that changes things. So, in hindsight, you're like, well, you get him back for another year. And unfortunately, we didn't get to see Eric all back, but they got a lot coming back and uh, they got to trim down the scholarship numbers. That's something that we'll continue to follow. I think maybe we're going to get a chance in the next hour to talk about linebacker. But I know you wanted to, as you brought up at the outset, kind of walk people through the announcement that was made by the playoff committee today. And I think put it in layman's terms because, you know, they always make this sound like a big <laughs> science project when they release information, whether it's the NCAA or the playoff committee. So I know you'll uh, break it down for us. So, folks, this is what we need to know going forward, starting this football season in 2024. There are 12 teams that will make the playoffs. Five of those are going to be selected as the five highest ranked conference champions. So we've got the four power fives. That <laughs> that makes a whole lot of sense. We've got the four power fives, the four power fours. I guess they are now the four power conferences, which there's an assumption 
that we can all make that they will be four of the five that will make it, but there will be five conference champions that automatically receive a bid based on being the five highest ranked conference champions. Then the next seven teams will be selected based on the college football playoff rankings, the at-large bids. And so that's really at the crux of what all this is. Uh, the the only thing that is an oddity in this, uh, at least for this particular season, is that the Pac-12 still exists technically. There are two teams in the Pac-12, and they will exist in that conference this year. They will play each other, and they are technically in the Pac-12 conference, and that's Washington State and Oregon State. But they will not comprise a conference that is being treated as a conference toward the playoff. So they cannot say, hey, we get a playoff spot uh, because we've got a conference champion. But they they are just kind of in this uh, just nowhere land as it pertains to a conference affiliation or as it pertains to a playoff. They're pl piecing together schedules that generally are Mountain West conference schedules. Uh, so that's kind of an oddity for them. And that's one of the reasons this has been held up for a couple months is what do we do with the Pac-12 and now the Pac-12 carnage? And what do we do with those teams? Well, they'll, they're going to be treated as at-large teams. They cannot win a conference, even though they technically are still their own conference. So just to clarify, is there a conference championship between those two teams? I was asking myself the same question as I was going through the article that was released today to think, okay, well, they play in the regular season, but they just <laughs> go ahead and play a conference championship game and whoever wins, regardless of what their record is. You know what they should that. do? Yeah, I'm serious. If they're playing a bunch of Mountain West teams, would it be better? I'm serious. Listen to this. Would it be better for their schedule to just play one time or would it be better to play best two out of three and then sprinkle in a bunch of Mountain West teams around it? Yeah, well, they're playing six, so I don't know what the rest of their schedule looks like. And then they're playing each other, so that's seven. So they're playing know, five but, other teams out there. I, I mean, I'd be, yeah, what are the five other teams? Are they power five teams? I'd have to look at the uh, the schedules. Uh, the reason I ask is because if you could grab, a, a you know, as an independent, they, they, for, uh, a de facto independent, which is what those teams are, even though they're scheduling Mountain West schools, I'm, I'd be like, hey, let's, I'd figure out a way I hope those two schools, because I don't want to see those two teams, those programs go to the dumps. Those have been solid football programs over recent time. I would hope that those two programs can figure out a way to work together. Um, and I'm sure you, I'm sure they'll find a home, right? Like if, like if Arizona State can find a home, why can't Oregon State and Washington State, other than maybe just the the connection that Arizona State had with Arizona and. You know, I know that wasn't quite apples to apples as it relates to what Oregon did with the Big Ten. By the way, let me just clarify something. So this was my first question when I read that announcement, and I haven't dove as deep as you probably have into this so far today. Five, the top five conference champions, as in the ones that are ranked the highest, make the playoff. So that sounds simple, and maybe I'm overcomplicating it in my own mind. But why are we? Did why is it five? Why do we? Why are we insisting on having five conference champions when there is not a power five anymore? So the previous model was six and six, meaning the top six conference champions made it, which we would presume to be the five power five champions plus okay. a group of five champion. Okay. So now they've just sized it down to one less. The only issue I have with that is are we taken on the name power four or the the name the quantifier power four because those four conferences you and i both know those four conferences are not equal right now no so that'd be my only my only issue um you know you get 12 playoff spots so you know you, you're not going to fill the the uh, playoff with you know 10 SEC and Big Ten teams and then two teams from other conferences. I understand that. But uh you're gonna get seven, you're gonna get seven at-large bids. Basically, what I'm saying is you're gonna have 
only of those first five in, you're only going to get one team from the Big Ten and one team from the SEC. So then the other at-larges, you have seven at-larges from there on out. So the most each conference like combined, the most the Big Ten slash SEC could get in with the current structure is nine between the two of them. There will be at least three non-Big Ten SEC schools that get in. Yes. That's all I'm saying. I just, with the the lack of parity with the conferences now, the clear lack of parity, that's the only reason I kind of question how how effective is that model per se. But I don't know how effective you can make it because I don't know what the structure of the top end of conference or alignment, how, what we should label that, how we should organize things. I, I just don't know. I posted a video this week where I basically laid out what reasonably we could expect out of the big 10 in particular in terms of playoff bids. And so I looked at the last 10 years included the teams from the PAC 12, which of course this is uh, an inexact and very imperfect undertaking because the schedules are going to be different. The teams are going to be different in regards to their records, but let's just take 2023 and consider that if you infuse the four teams from the West coast, that Washington, Oregon, Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, all would qualify for a playoff. So that's five. But let's even take into consideration, sure, they're going to be playing each other, some other difficult games. So they're going to incur more losses. But all of those teams were safely, except maybe Penn State with two losses, safely within a 12-team playoff. So even if Ohio State would have lost another game. Washington, another one or two. Michigan, another one or two. Oregon, another game. They're all going to make the playoff in a year such as what we experienced this past year. I think that's on the high end. I would expect on average that the Big Ten would have four teams in a 12-team playoff field. And by the way, I know some people are going to, when I say, you know, the most the Big Ten and the SEC can get in combined is nine teams, some people are going to be like, well, why? That's insane to think that those two conferences combined could get nine teams in. There's 18 teams in the Big Ten. <laughs> that, that's so, I mean, that's an average of four and a half per conference. When you have, you know, the Big Ten occupying at least what five of the top 10 programs right now in the country. And the SEC probably occupying the other five. Um, maybe maybe Florida State or Miami should be in those conversations. Probably not. Um, when's the last time you've ranked programs nationally? <laughs> Just the brand, the, the 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 football brand that they are. Oh, not um, talking about how good they are on the field. No, no, no. The yeah, that's the program includes tra- tradition and trajectory, re- all that stuff. Success. I do that every off season, but I include the current state sure. of the program. I yeah. guess what I'm saying, like you're maybe I'm just go ranting on this, but you have, you have a lot of big brands in these two conferences. So four and a half per is not that many teams. When you think exactly about it. the way you just broke it down, it is not ridiculous. It sounds ridiculous on the surface until you just broke it down to four and a half out of 18 and 16. And it's not ridiculous, especially considering that at the end of last season, the SEC and the Big Ten comprised the entire top 10, meaning the future Big Ten and SEC comprised the entire top 10. I think what will be interesting, and I, and I haven't studied recent rankings, like rankings from past years as much, especially as it relates to group of five schools, but I think it'll be interesting to see what the distribution looks like for some of those G5 schools or what we previously considered to be G5 conferences, because how many times have we had, you know, a one loss Toledo, a one loss Coastal Carolina, there's still going to be that that might be where there's the most controversy as it relates to rankings, right? Like it, it's, it's hard to blame the committee for not putting a nine and three Iowa team in at three losses, right? Like, you know, you, you should have won more games, but if you're Toledo and you go, you know, 12 and one, win the Mac, but coastal Carolina gets in at 12 and one because they were ranked one spot higher. That's going to suck for Toledo Rockets fans. And I guess that's the name of the game. You can't have, you can't put every, 
you know, uh, one or two loss G5 program in, but I could see that still being a, a point of contention for a lot of those smaller programs. Troy. What I find, what I find to be counterproductive in this, and I think I, I just did a live stream taking calls and so forth. I think I called it moronic actually, is that at the same time that we are now officially including the group of five. So previously they were considered, but there wasn't an official seat at the table and only one broke through in 10 years, that being Cincinnati in 2021. So now we are officially including a spot where there was no spot. The group of five has been diminished. So when the group of five was better with Cincinnati, UCF, Houston, BYU, and SMU that is now joining the ACC, the best programs in the group of five, when it was being excluded, were out there to participate. And now they're in the power five. And so the group of five has been weakened considerably. Now we're giving them a spot at the table. But there have been, there have been like I, some of the programs I mentioned, Toledo, Troy, Liberty. You know, a lot of those teams are the Coastal Carolina. Those are the teams that have, what, what are you looking at me like that for? That have what? <laughs> that have had 12 and one seasons. Against the bunch of crap. Okay. Well, some of the, listen, uh, Coastal Carolina, well, Troy, Liberty, those teams I just named, those teams have been ranked. They've been top 25. They shouldn't teams. be ranked. I know you don't have them in your hold they, up they your shirt. Be ranked you unless unless they earn it. your shirt for a second. Yeah. So <laughs> if you've just joined us here in the last few months, it's the top 25 that actually makes sense. And I've got nothing against those schools. I, I truly don't. If they if they earn that ranking. But that's the whole point, Mark. They're not that's the whole point of having us at least one spot for them at the table. It's not to get you're basically when you you're just uh, allowing a spot for a team like Cincinnati that was playing in the American Conference a spot. You're just saying, well, the AAC is the next strongest conference. Why don't we open it to all the quote unquote weak conferences and figure out a way to get the best team of the weak conferences? I think we still accomplish that through this structure. Yes, I was just making the point that that that. Uh, that group of teams in the group of five, all those conferences that has been weakened greatly. And so it's just ironic in a poor, in a bad way that now they get the opportunity to represent the group of five when the group of five isn't anywhere close to as good as it was just a couple of years ago, they've lost their best programs. Uh, so my we, question is, my question is Mark, since we've gone to the 14 playoff, you mentioned Cincinnati, how many programs from the G5 that was previously in place, what were the top two programs each year? Do you can you recite those teams at the Pretty end of close. the year, end yeah. of the season? Yeah. Okay. Who were they? Were they always from the AAC? Were they always Cincinnati, BYU? So you had Houston, UCF, Cincinnati dominating that landscape as the as the top team. Now Boise State was in 2014. Houston was in 2015. And uh, Central Michigan was act no, it was PJ's team, Western Michigan, uh, in 2016 was technically it's almost. But again, we're going back to the rankings. So my example for this past season in 2023 is that Liberty received that Group of Five position in the New Year's Six. I thought that SMU was a better team. They were 11 and two. They won the American Conference. And who did SMU lose to? Well, they lost to two Power 5 teams. Liberty did not play a Power 5 team. SMU plays in a better conference, but Liberty got the nod to play in the New Year's Six and got completely annihilated. Shouldn't this encourage some of those G5 programs to, like a Toledo, a Liberty, shouldn't this incite them to schedule better? Or am I crazy in thinking that? Because now that they know, hey, if we impress the committee enough to be ranked higher, and we can win even our weak conference. Hey, if we can knock off somebody in the non-conference, now we got a shot, a reasonable chance. Or look capable, play well, compete. Well, yeah. just help the strength of schedule, right? I mean, have somebody on your resume. Uh, it's like an NCAA tournament resume in basketball that, you know, 
you're just not playing anybody either way. You can't even get a, I mean, I think playing, so I'd rather play somebody and get throttled because at least you went out there and played them. Um, then just beat a bunch of teams and have nothing to look at. Uh, maybe I, that's not how the t- tournament committee looks at it. Maybe that's not how the playoff committee will, will look at things. Yeah. And it's not as though I've never ranked group of five teams. I'm just, again, I, I don't understand this mentality we see out of the AP voters every year. So for example, Liberty this past year played a deplorable schedule, not their fault, but they played a deplorable schedule and they're moving along the season, progressing at six and oh, seven and oh, eight and oh. And at some point the AP voters just decide, okay, they're nine and oh now, or they're 10 and oh now we're going to rank them. They didn't, they just beat another horrible team. They just beat another bottom of the rung, one of the worst 10 or 15 teams in the country, but we're just going to magically decide that this is the week that because now they're 10 and 0 or they're 9 and 0, we're going to rank them. I think it's been proven down through the years. Shoot, I've got, I have yet to produce this video. I've got, I've run through every power five versus group of five uh, matchup from this past season to run down just the disparity, just to emphasize and underline the disparity between the two levels of play. I think I, said to you at one point when we were having one of our bowl conversations that I looked at all the group of five champions and how well they played in bowl games against power five teams. And it was terrible or no, how, how well they played against power five teams in the bowl games and in their regular season games, they were like two and 13. How many, uh, mid major, and you may not know this, how many mid major AQ teams are there in college basketball? In uh, the aren't there like tournament? Aren't there like three hundred and fifteen or twenty Division One college basketball teams? That, that sounds about right. But so I mean, the, oh, you're talking about the automatic qualify. I got you. Yeah. So you have it's at almost, least it's about half the field, isn't it? Well, so that's I guess that's my point. I don't think it's quite half the field, but that's my point. Is your argument if you were doing college basketball would be? That's ridiculous as well, because I guarantee you, we know that we we can't even like part of it is that's the sport. Like you have an opportunity as those. I think that's the great thing about college basketball. You give those minor league teams an opportunity to make the postseason and compete with the big boys. Where in reality, would the would the top 68 teams in college basketball, would only half of those teams be from power five if you just looked at resume and and if you were actually able to look at talent, everything that we put into evaluating a team or a program, no, probably, you know, 90% of the top 68 teams in college basketball would be from a power five conference, but that's kind of part of the excitement of being able to, to play your season. I think I, I, I don't mind that. I know it's a smaller field to work with. So, you know, devoting one spot, but you're also, like I said, in college basketball, you're devoting, 20 to 30 spots by the way i guess i'm uh, representing myself as an elitist and i'm not because i do enjoy the college basketball approach to it but that's just the um the limitations to college football is because of the physicality of the sport you can't play all those games real quickly just so ed rogers is aware he made a comment a couple minutes ago how uh we and he says we like he played in the game we put 70 on toledo a couple years ago he's talking about the buckeyes uh, didn't the time, didn't the, the previous meeting between those two, which was like back in, I remember that game back in, I believe it was 2011. Wasn't that like a three point game or something like that? It was a one score game. Yes. Against Toledo. Yes. So, that was the worst Ohio state team in the yeah. last 25 years. But I'm just saying you're bringing up one result. They, yeah. they don't play each other very often. Absolutely. And that yeah. was a good, remember that was a, a pretty good Toledo team that Ohio state did put a lot of points on. Yeah. And I believe Toledo were their offensive numbers. How many did they score in that game? 21. I think it was 77, 21. Okay. So their, their defense was terrible. And Ohio state's offense was incredible, but um, were, were Toledo's numbers better than their, the final score, like offensive numbers in that game. Or am I wrong? I don't remember. I couldn't okay. tell you. 
I remember that was the season that Ohio State and Iowa played because I think that was one of those funny statistics that we were running through before the Ohio State-Iowa game because I think Ohio State scored more touchdowns in that game than Iowa had entering the game against Ohio State. Um, yeah, I'm just looking here to see what the uh, team statistics were. Yeah, so Ohio State, uh, you know, the the 307 yards of total offense for Toledo. How did how did Ohio State go for 760, 763 yards of offense in that game? <laughs> was that that game was they don't play that game ever at Toledo, right? That game was in the shoe. Oh yeah. That's when one is the last I, time Iowa traveled to a group of five? I'm amazed when big brands in the Power Five will travel to a group of five. Ohio State won't do that. Iowa well, won't do that. Well, I watched a game. It was in the, I mean, they've done it in the Ference era. They did it. Um, who did they play? Was it like Arkansas State on the road? Really? I know they played, they played at Northern Illinois. Was it? Uh, did they? Look this up. You're challenging me on this. I got to look it up. Iowa versus Northern Illinois. Well, they played at Soldier Field against Northern Illinois. That probably wouldn't count, right? No, I'm not counting that. When did they play on campus at a group of five? I don't sure remember they, that happening. Let me look here. I'm pretty sure they played. We're going to find this out. Um, at Northern. Let's see here. 2018. And while you're looking that up, I just want to make it clear that I am not against the group of five being represented in the playoff. It's just you're deciding that we are going to play a playoff with basically the 11 best teams in the country, not exactly, but probably just very close to the 11 best teams in the country, and then like the 50th best team in the country. Well, maybe they didn't play it. I, I guess the two meetings they had against Northern Illinois were at Soldier Field. I remember they had two of them, and they were both at Soldier Field. There was somebody, though, somebody, somebody helped me out in the chat. Was it Arkansas State they played? It would have been like back in the probably either Brad Banks era or Drew Tate era. Would be my guess. I'll have to find. Yeah, it must not have been DeKal, but um. Anyways, while I'm looking this up, Mark, uh, do we want to? What was the other thing we we're going to address here at the the outset of the show? Uh, well, let's address Erica's uh, comment here about uh, Vegas and the win total released. I don't know that. Um, I know we discussed Iowa schedule and possibilities of competing in the big 10, getting to the playoff. I don't know if the win total had been released by Vegas at the, at the point that we met last week, but Eric is saying, so how about the blatant disrespect from Vegas again this year? LOL, we will win more than seven and a half games. And I agree with you, Erica. And I generally defend Vegas to a certain extent when people bring up win totals and say, oh, that's ridiculous. And that's ridiculous. And look at that because Vegas generally, generally, proves to know what they're talking about. And even if they miss on a team, it's a team that we all missed on. So they missed just as badly as the rest of us. But you are right, Erica. Last year, Corey and I both sat here and just could not believe that that win total was seven <laughs> and a half. And here we are one year later, and we're looking at that same win total. And again, cannot believe seven and a half. Well, I haven't said that. No. I have not said that, but, but I would agree. I would agree with you. Okay. I would agree with you. Uh, I'm looking up these, these seasons. So, and I'm just going back here. might as well talk, talk you through this as we go here. So in 20, 2009, they played. No, 2009 was the Arkansas state game. They played in Kinnick. I'll, I'll keep looking here, Mark. Uh, but I, guy I know on the screen here. Answer. Ah, Yes, that's I was getting I knew it was a Mac team. I said Northern Illinois. I knew it was a Mac team. I vaguely remember this game. That was again against uh, Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah, <laughs> At my, that's why I looked at it. That's why I was watching it. Yes, that was. Uh, let me go back to 2002. Uh, it was an 11 and two Iowa team. Yep. That scheduled a game at Miami, Ohio. Twenty nine. And, and that's a game they lost in the regular season, right? No, they won that one. Oh, but they lost to somebody out uh, Iowa State probably because they went undefeated in the yes. Big Ten. They yeah. blew a lead to Iowa State. 31-36 was the game against Iowa yeah. State. 
Yeah, they played at my. They played at Jaeger Stadium in Oxford, Ohio. What was the score of that game? 29-24. Hmm. This says it was on ESPN Plus, but was ESPN Plus in existence at that time? Or was ESPN so. Plus something else back then? I, I think it was. But it wasn't it wasn't like ESPN Plus now. What was ESPN I, Plus? That was, that, was, that was my first year at ESPN. Yeah, but ESPN Plus is a streaming service now. So what was ESPN Plus back then? It was something like that. I think it was an added cable tier. Okay. Is what it was. You paid extra, got all these random channels that showed. Yes, Hummus Hero. ESPN 360. That's what it was. Yeah, that's what it's yeah. called. I remember that. I remember ESPN 360. Why would you? Why? Let me ask you. Why would they have scheduled? I wonder why they scheduled that game. Like, what was the reason for scheduling it? Yeah, I, I don't know why anyone of Iowa status would go travel somewhere like that. Even back then? Actually, if you look at um, many of these teams' schedules, I don't. I can't speak for Iowa. I don't remember their non-conference schedules going back into the 80s and 90s off the top of my head, except for the big teams they played. Is a lot of this uh, scheduling of these smaller group of five teams, this is a newer concept to college football. Not for Iowa. Like if you go back and look at Michigan's schedules every year, like in the early 90s, it's it's pretty crazy. What do you mean it's pretty crazy? They're playing like Colorado, Virginia, and Oklahoma. Oh, you're just saying playing those non G5, no, non G5. Yeah, like they, they didn't play anyone in the group of five back then. Uh, okay, I'm seeing a game at Syracuse. Yeah, I think that one against Miami, Ohio was the only one. Uh, in the Ferentz era that, that they've played where they traveled to. I'm pretty sure. Let me check 2007. Yeah, I, I don't think. 1990, Michigan's out of conference schedule. Notre Dame, UCLA, and Maryland. In okay. 1989, Notre Dame, UCLA, and Maryland. In 1988, Notre Dame, Miami of Florida, and Wake Forest. 87, Notre Dame, Washington State. They, they played Long Beach State. Okay, there's one in three years. 86, Michigan's playing Notre Dame, Oregon State, and Florida State. <laughs> this, yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of like college basketball. That a lot of Iowa fans are frustrated by the fact that they don't play Drake and you and I anymore. It used to be. I mean, my, I'm growing up, I, I loved that game. That was, they'd play at Drake, they'd play at you and I, and... The women still do that, but the men won't do it. But my point is Iowa State or Iowa. taking Michigan as an example. They're not playing any bad teams. None. 1986, Notre Dame, South Carolina, and Maryland. That's their out-of-conference get. This is every year. And who did Michigan play? Was it last year or the year before that they had that horrendous non-conference schedule? The last it was last two year. years. The last two years, they played no one. <laughs> Yeah, see, that doesn't make sense to me. And the national champions, they, you know, earned it yeah, down. They the backed track. it up. Yeah, they've they've got Texas this year. Good. That's just, I mean, for a, I think that's ridiculous for a power, especially with the expanded playoff. You can afford to lose games. Go out and play somebody. Do I really want to get people fired up with this next topic? Yeah, go ahead and do it, Mark. I, I want to know what your perspective on this is. Okay, for the this record, is my perspective. I did not consult with Mark about his perspective on this situation prior to going live, but I'm happy to debate him. So I don't know if I, if I need to, maybe I'll agree with you, Mark. Okay. So Caitlin Clark became Iowa's all-time leading scorer, became the, I'm sorry, the NCAA's all-time leading scorer in women's basketball. Okay. Correct. So I saw a few posts actually from our buddy, Elliot Clough. He sent out a poll that said something like Caitlin Clark is the greatest athlete in the history of Iowa sports. And I think his two selections were yes and yes, basically making a point that she is the greatest athlete in the history of the university of Iowa. 
What are you going to say, Mark? Go ahead and say okay, what, what I'm say. about to say is, number one, I'm not prepared to have the conversation that based on merit or accomplishments is she. I know that, um, correct me on his name if I get it wrong, because I haven't thought about him in years and years and years, but Dan Gable, correct. He is the Iowa wrestler of great fame from like 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Do I have that name correct? Anyway. Go ahead. Niall Kinnick. We could run down the number of, of, of great Iowa athletes throughout history. And Brian is telling me to watch it, Mark, because I think he knows where I'm headed on this. Here's my point that while I'm not prepared to make my list of greatest athletes in Iowa history based on accomplishments, because I've not researched it, looked into it, thought about it, because I would want to do those things. I could spitball one that would be fairly close, but that's not my style. I like to be precise, like to get it right. And real quick, just to make a correction, because you said yes. it, I don't want to have you, people are going to start correcting us in the chat if we're not careful. Dan Gable wrestled at Iowa State, coached at Iowa. Oh, okay. Well, I'm completely wrong on that then. My bad. But, but no, I mean, I, I, I get your line of thinking. You're, you're not bringing him up because we're not having the... Yeah, for some reason, I thought he was an Iowa wrestler. Okay, regardless, uh, there, would, there would be uh, candidates from all sports. Okay, if we are having the accomplishments argument that the greatest athlete is tied to the best accomplishments, then certainly she is either at the outset, at the very top of that list and argument, or she may be a slam dunk winner. I don't know that. However, I look at it this way as well. I think this argument can be made as well. And I'll start it out by saying, I was asked several times, when I was a father, still am a father, but when I was a father of two high school athletes, I was asked this a few times. Who's a better athlete, your son or your daughter? And what do you think my response was? You can't compare the two. Perfect. My response was to give them a blank stare to say, basically, you can't compare male athletes and female athletes as athletes. There's no comparison. But you also, let me, like, can I counter that for a second? Sure. You also can't compare a football athlete with a wrestler. Same sex, different sports. I, I don't think you can do that. So if we're talking about the greatest athletes in general, I think the implication there, the inference there is what you said earlier. We're, we're comparing in their uh, respective sports who has the, 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 who's more iconic, who's the, the greatest in their, respective sports. So one is women's basketball, one's men's basketball, one's wrestling, one's football. Okay. Who's more. And now you have the best of the best everywhere. Who's the most iconic greatest accomplishments. I think that's where the argument would be made. Okay. So I get your point that it's difficult to compare across sports. It's impossible. Okay. It's impossible. Well, it's difficult. It's not impossible, but, but I get your point. I, I understand your point. I agree with it to a large extent. I'm making the point that men are better athletes than women. So you can't compare the two. That's all there is to it. That's that's not debatable. So you my point like about that. my point about my son and my daughter was I would I would give a blank stare to this individual. This happened three or four times. Who's a better athlete, your son or your daughter? Be like, are you kidding me? As an athlete, yeah. You're, so here's here's where we're going to have a, a debate because I think there's a difference between saying who's the better athlete and who is more athletic. There is a difference between those two terms. Sure. And yes, who's more an athletic? An athlete encompasses also what you're competing at, what sport you're competing at with against. And sure. Caitlin Clark is competing in, in women's basketball. A golfer may not by definition be a great athlete, but be a great golfer. Oh, but is Tiger that what Woods you're telling me? They're they they may not need to be athletic. Tiger Woods is one of the greatest athletes of all time in my opinion sure but i mean I like who's more athletic tiger woods or michael jordan uh probably michael jordan i mean i would put my my yes. chips on michael jordan when, when i think of being an athlete i think of speed strength 
leaping ability, all of those things, being an athlete, what you have to do to be an athlete. I think that's where we're in on different terms with this. I, with I'm not comparing things. male and female athletes because there's no comparison between the two as athletes. There's Ath not an well, athletic. That's where comparison. we're not on the same page as it relates to the definition of athlete versus athletic. You're defining the word athletic to me, whereas you're, you're saying that, that the word athletic is actually athlete to you. And that's extremely close, correct? Athletic and athlete. <laughs> yeah, I, I, they are close. They are yeah. close, but that's what I'm saying. They're different words because athlete takes on the sport, the game, all of that. Uh, Tiger Woods, do you think Tiger Woods is some, do you think he has some insane vertical? I, I doubt it. I don't think he's probably the quickest laterally. He doesn't need to be. Denny Hamlin, a tremendous yes, NASCAR. sport does not require it. Right. Like John Daly, like is John Daly at literally the bottom of every list because he's fat and he smokes? Like he's, he's a great athlete. He's not very athletic. He's not athletic, really. Well, I shouldn't say it all. That's not fair to him because you got to be athletic. You got to have athleticism to like, be able to be again, an athlete. There's no comparison between male athletes and female athletes. So we shouldn't compare them and say that somebody is the greatest athlete uh, overall as a female with male athletes involved because there's it's not even close. It's not debatable as in terms of being an athlete, doing athletic things. Again, so not, you're making those two words synonymous. And I don't, I don't make those two words synonymous. Well, good and goodness aren't the same word, but they come from the same core word and definition. Yeah. So there's very, uh, not, they're not synonyms though, Mark. Are they synonyms? Do you think an athlete and athleticism, those are both, those are, are both nouns. Are those sy synonyms? No, they are not synonyms. So they there are similarities there between yes. the two words. Large similarities. Synonyms. There's no question. Th this is, listen, I've, he I've heard that, and I'm not taking a stance on this either way, but I, I, I remember hearing, do you remember when John McEnroe got torched? For what he said a few years ago about Serena Williams? Uh, yes, I know something about it. So I'm because a, I, he I'm said a, he could beat her in tennis. He's no, no, that, that wasn't what he, the point of what he said. He said like the top hundred men could beat Serena Williams in tennis, and he got ripped for it. And and I, I don't know if he's right or wrong. I know that when Chris Ever Lloyd, let, I know, I know, I know, I don't need to know about this thing from forty years ago. Yes, yeah, when she was the number one tennis player in the world, she was married to the like five hundredth male tennis player in the world that nobody cared about. But she was asked, "What happens when you two play?" And she's like, "Are you kidding me? I don't. We don't play because I can't compete with him. We volley. That's that's called common sense, right? That's called, yeah, that, exactly. But I'm just making the statement." And I know it's not a popular one in today's age to tell the truth, to be truthful about things, but that's why I'm here is to tell the truth. And I refuse to compare male and th female athletes because female athletes can't compare to male athletes when it comes to athleticism. That's why when somebody asked me the question, who's a better athlete, your, your son or your daughter, I would not insult my daughter to put her in that conversation, even though she accomplished more in high school as an athlete than my son did. But who's faster, who can jump higher, who's stronger, who's all, all the components and characteristics of being an athlete, who is better? Well, he is. Yeah. And I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm simply saying my definition of athlete is not purely based on athleticism. That's all I'm okay. saying. But I absolutely understand where you're coming from. And under the confines of of the definition of the term in your your mind, it's ab you're absolutely correct. And nobody can debate that. That's, I mean, if you want to debate that, you can have the debate. I thought what John McEnroe said was there was nothing wrong with what John McEnroe said because it was factual. And he wasn't having he never said that Serena Williams wasn't the greatest tennis athlete. He simply said that she would get beaten by any of the top 100 players on the men's side or whatever, top 50. And that's probably correct. Now, you can't prove that unless it actually happened. But I would agree. Like, if Caitlin Clark went up in a one-on-one contest against Joe Wieskamp or 
any of the men who have played at Iowa over the past past 10 years. Yeah. At a one-on-one contest, the, the, I, I would almost guarantee you that the, the male athlete would win almost every time, but I, I do incorporate uh, accomplishments and uh, I mentioned how iconic a person is in their respective sport, all those things. Because again, I, I could go back to wrestling and say like Spencer Lee, Spencer Lee is one of the greatest athletes in Iowa history. Part of that's because he was a three-time national champion. Um, he, you know, he was dominant at Iowa throughout his time period. He was also a charismatic guy. Like I know that we're talking about accomplishments and athleticism and whatnot, but I also think personality, a lot of this is so opinion based, like a personality is part of that, right? How Caitlin Clark carries herself is part of why people in Iowa love her because she has an edge that no other women's okay. college basketball player has had. And mm-hmm. she backs up her talk with her game. So that's what I'm saying. I, I, I don't think you can compare Spencer Lee though to Luca Garza because they play different sports and the, the te- the measures of even athleticism would be different with those two athletes because they're completely, they're different ends of the spectrum. They've trained for different things. One guy's seven foot, one guy's five, five, you know, so you're introducing with the personality and all of that, the charisma you're introducing a whole other component that I don't take into account when rating athletes. Well, that goes into how much someone is, uh, you know, how much someone is respected, how much someone is, I don't want to say immortalized. That's not the right word, but, uh, their, their status as a legend of that program or that franchise, right? Ty Cobb is arguably the greatest hitter of all time well he's a racist jackass jerk that's his legacy as a person if you had to ask me who's the most athletic person of all time i might say usain bolt i mean usain bolt would probably be in the conversation um maybe muhammad ali but like what happens when Muhammad Ali steps on a basketball court with Michael Jordan? What happens when Michael Jordan steps on a in a boxing ring against Muhammad Ali? I mean, I think it's just pointless to have those conversations in general because it's apples to oranges any way you slice it. I, I'm I'm guessing that one of them would fare better outside of their sport than the other. Not they wouldn't be able to compete with the other. <laughs> but they would probably do better. Somebody yeah. would show themselves to be more capable in another sport. Michael Jordan went and played baseball, played in the minor leagues. That's pretty exceptional. Yeah. And I think uh, for most people, LeBron James is an excellent example. A lot of people have wanted LeBron to play football because they think he'd be a great tight end. Maybe he would. Um, I don't know. He's got, he's got a football body, so to speak. And we've seen guys cross over, have success. Michael Jordan had his, well, I mean, a lot of guys have, have played baseball and played basketball. And, uh, you know, the Iowa, look at Ben Keeter right now at Iowa. He's wrestling. He's a football player. And, uh, you know, Addison Estringa, he's gonna, in line to be the starting tight end at Iowa here in a couple of years. And um, he was a Iowa baseball commit at one time. So there is some crossover from a, a skill and talent and ability standpoint. Yes, I agree with that. Mike 3883 is getting to the, he's getting to the core of my argument yeah and i understand the argument that's i I understand so erica i believe has another super chat coming in here thank you erica can you guys do one of those iowa quizzes can't remember the name of the site but mark did a michigan quiz the other night i sent thank you erica we appreciate you i sent Corey a dm this week because i rediscovered one of my favorite sites, which is right up my alley. It's about trivia of any sort, but I focus on sports, of course. Uh, And during my live stream, I introduced the folks to Sporkle. And uh, you, you pick a topic and then you type in something that's as close to what you would like to be quizzed on as possible. Uh, Iowa football. And then you can get even more specific than that and see how many, Iowa quizzes they have on Iowa football and then it's got a timer and then you start to to fill in the answers and it's runs on a timer and so I 
I actually quiz myself on the, yes, I quiz myself on the 2023 Michigan football roster. And I was fairly proud of myself. I have to admit, I hate to say that, but I was fairly proud that I got 41 Michigan football players. So how do you think I would do with Iowa? 2023 Iowa football roster. Oh, you would do exceptional. I know that. I don't know. Would yeah, I? Yeah, you would. You would. Now, the one that I sent to you, and I didn't send it to you for you to do it. I was just sending it as an example. I think it was asking to name the Iowa leaders in passing yards, rushing yards, receiving yards, sacks, tackles, interceptions every year since like 2000. I can get hooked on doing things like that. Yeah, we should do that on here. How hard would that be to incorporate into our live show? Not not hard at all. We should we should do that. And yeah. and I know it's I know it's 5:30 we kind of ranted for a while oh, do we yes, want to do we want to save the linebacker talk for next week? Yes, let's do that. We're going to start setting everyone up for a spring practice. We'll break down uh, a position every week. Uh, I, I've got one other question for you, Corey, real yeah. quick, because I could care less about this topic, but a lot of people love this. And I'm just curious, are you into video games? Are you, do you care about EA sports college football 25? <laughs> uh, I, I don't really care. Okay. No, I mean, I, do I play video games on occasion? I will admit that I own a game system. And on occasion for recreation, I will play. I am not a gamer, never have been a, a gamer, but I grew up in the video game era. And on occasion, I'll play, you know, NBA 2K or something like that. I don't play the old, I used to play the old college football uh, games. Uh, will I buy the the new, the new game? Maybe, but I, I no, I really couldn't care less. <laughs> I see these these grown men like crying when they see these banners on social media. It's finally here. <laughs> it's just like this is ridiculous. This is insane. I mean, these but these are grown men, so I understand it, it, people care about it. All right, everyone, head on over to uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm this week. Keep up with Corey and everything that he has going there. When are the next basketball post games? I appreciate you asking that. Tony in the chat, I was about to send this out to uh, all of our subscribers. No post game tonight. So the men play Michigan State due to a scheduling conflict. Post game will be tomorrow. So stay tuned on uh, when that post game will occur. It'll be a belated post game show tomorrow. So enjoy the game this evening. Enjoy, uh, you know, most Iowa fans that hop on the show don't get to watch the second window of games if, if Iowa plays at that 6 p.m. slot. So enjoy the 8 p.m. slot. And we'll be back tomorrow talking Iowa hoops. And um, it's been kind of a slow last week for me. I've kind of hit a wall mentally, I think, with all these post-game shows. But I, I, we're, we're getting close to March Madness, so it'll be fun. If the men don't make it, the women will. And uh, Caitlin Clark effect, it'll be a fun couple of months, no question about it. Uh, Erica, thank you so much for your super chat uh, contributions today. We appreciate you. We appreciate everyone who uh, stops by each and every week. We'll be back here next Tuesday at 430 Central. Also, keep in mind that uh, if you grab the Amazon link and use the Amazon link that we provide, that uh, you help grow the channels here at the Voice of College Football without spending one penny. We'll see you back here next Tuesday, everyone.